Hi, my name is Spiro Christopoulos and I'm from the class of 2020, a recent graduate here at Trinity Grammar School. Today we have another instalment of the Old Boy Success Stories, uh, the vodcast. It's made for the Trinity community, it's made for present students, but it's also made for past students. Uh, the Old Boy community, the OTU, so it's a very, very important series that we'd like to continue a little bit. And today we have a very, very special edition uh, and a very, very special guest. Now today's guest comes from the class of 1977. He's the founder and chairman of Australian-based designer and manufacturer of audio software and microphones, Rode Microphones. Today's guest is also know, known as an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and an ambassador for Australian manufacturing and export excellence. He was the Ernst & Young Aussie Entrepreneur of the Year in 2014 and was awarded Australia's highest national honour, the Order of Australia, in 2016. He's leaving a huge mark on this country and there's still a long way to go for our guest today. And he is no other than Mr. Peter Friedman, AM. Thank you, sir. That's, that's, a, that's a lovely intro. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it in this Make This Studio. It's my first interview as an old boy, so it takes a bit of a different angle, but it's great to have you here today. Very good. Today. Very good. I'm going to start by going back a few years to your early childhood and I know you've had an interesting upbringing, but tell us about uh, where it all started for you, where you were born, where you grew up and the journey uh, to Australia. Sure. So um, my dad was born in London, uh, mum was born in Sweden and she moved to London uh, in the late 40s. They met, got married, my sister was born there and around 56, end of 56 they moved to Sweden, which is where my mum was born, as I said, in Stockholm, and that's where I was born. So, um, 58, I was born in Stockholm, and yeah, I was uh, a Swede and didn't speak English. And lots of things happened during that time. It was very cut off country. It was hard to get a, well, you couldn't get a job without a work permit, and you couldn't get a work permit without a job. They really mm -hmm. didn't want people there, yeah, a little bit xenophobic. So, um, eventually, he did get one, and, but he was self taught. Um, didn't have much schooling and, and in fact uh, I think some of his learning difficulties which I don't think were diagnosed then I inherited which uh, and that, that explained a few things for me later anyway he did very well became a senior engineer in electronics in a company there but it came to the end of his ability and he wanted to get out on top it's quite a sad thing uh, and in 66 um, he was offered the sound equipment brand Dynacord for Australia and it was the number one, and it was just like, let's go, mum and dad thinking. Mm -hmm. And so this big uh, adventure and off we went. But uh, for my sister and I, it was you know, one minute we're in Sweden and can't speak English, uh, next minute we're on a boat and then here. You know? And so, uh, yeah, pretty tough, I suppose. And, and Australia then wasn't uh, like it is now, you know? not as uh, open multiculturally and certainly no Swedes. Yeah. So yeah, that was my, my early life before, before uh, Australia. Now you started at Trinity back uh, in year seven, mm. the year 72. That's or, right. And uh, big school, it was, you know, here at Summer Hill, it was thriving. It was pretty big at that time. But what was your earliest memory of Trinity, Peter? Yeah, um, frightening for me. Um, you know, I mean, all the, I mean, the, the headmaster, James Wilson Hogg, lovely guy. Um, well, I remember him eloquent, the flowing robes, the two red setters. You know, amazing guy um, and really interested in students. Uh, not every teacher or, or uh, master was the same, but he, he was very good. Um, and everybody called him the boss. It was not one person who had anything uh, to uh, say derogatory about him, which is mm. like, wow, because it's always some nickname or you know, something. Yeah. But no, not with him. He was loved. But he'd been there since 44. Wow. Um, so, uh, but it's funny, I look at him. And he left um, after 31 years. When I got here, uh, well, when he left, he was 65. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm going to be 63 this year. He was a young man, but, you know, at the time I thought he was ancient. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any particular staff members or teachers that you felt mentored you during your time here at Trinity? You've, were there any staff members in particular that, you know? Yeah, people mind? stand out. There was, uh, in academics, there was, uh, there was one, I can't remember his first name. I think it was Mr. Clancy, his name was. And I was, you know, terrible at pretty well everything because I didn't, in Sweden, I hadn't started school, mm -hmm. so I was a couple of years behind. I didn't read or write when I got here at all. So, um, yeah, so, and then you kind of, it's amazing how you can do all the cup tricks and people don't find out, you know, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty uh, freaky though. But um, he uh, put some, I was just bombing out, but he, 
he was just the kind of guy who was sort of putting faith in you and maybe seeing you could rise, and he did, and I wouldn't, didn't want to let him down, and I went to the top of the class and put up into advanced. Just that guy. Now, I bombed when I didn't have him, but it shows you what a teacher who can do if they decide to inspire somebody, you know, because it became, I'm not going to let that guy down. Yeah. Mm. Very important. N not many like that. Yeah, Another guy stands out, uh, Don Holder, Uncle Don, um, you know, sweetheart of a man. So much fun in music. We'd bring all whatever records we want to play, you know, Led Zeppelin, Alice Cooper, you know, anything you can think about. He just, that's our music. He wanted to look at it, discuss it, and then um, listen to him play the, the organ. The organ's still working, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the organ's in the chapel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, no, yeah, I'm so, so sorry. Still, yeah. yeah. So uh, he, lunchtime, he'd be in there practicing and he could play like, like a whiz and um, she'd get him to play Takata and Fugue. You know, and it was just awesome. So he was one of those guys that uh, that you really loved. Um, I never saw him angry, um, and because he, he didn't want to upset him, you know, they, they knew how to um, make you love him and want to do the right thing for him, rather than any kind of discipline thing. Mm. So um, yeah, very inspiring people. Fast forwarding a few years, you left Trinity, mm -hmm. um, and then you transitioned into the business, you know, Road Microphones. It's well, it wasn't my, wasn't Road. The, the family business before that. Tell us about the family business yeah. and how that transition to road came yeah. about. So my father got sick around 1969 with heart problems. Uh, sad, just a young man. Uh, he was just mowing the lawn and started getting angina, you know, chest pain. And so he'd always, he got worse and worse. And then he'd had open heart surgery quite early. So mm. on and off, I was working at the, my parents' shop, which is just down the road, mm. go down Prospect. Across the road, and it was you know between Asheville and and, um, and Summer Hill on uh, Liverpool Road. That's where the, the shop was. Mm. So, but by the time I was sixteen, I was running it, and that along with you know I had no way I could do any of the the work because I, I didn't know my times table. I still don't. Yeah. And um, you know it's um, it's funny stuff, and not being able to read or really mm. comp compose anything. Like, hey, this is a joke. Uh, Latin was good, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I got one out of a hundred and fifty for signing my name. <laughs> Still but, a hard subject. Don't yeah, it? man, uh, bizarre. Yeah. So anyway, then it was like, well, I got to take over, and from sixteen on, uh, I was there running it under. Of course, luckily, Dad didn't let me do too many stupid things. And then a few years go by, I'm there. Around, he was, I was twenty nine. He passed away, and um, I uh, took over completely then, and really did some stupid stuff. It was late eighties and uh, borrowed a lot of money. And that's when interest rates were crazy. You know, I don't know if you studied that part of it, but yeah. And uh, interest rates with penalties, if you were late, got up to 22% for me and you're never paying that back. I'm sorry. You know, it's impossible. I used to tell people it felt like, um, you know, trying to fill in the Grand Canyon with a shovel, you know, but I lucked it and that's where road came. So, you know, I, uh, I had a, a mic that I'd bought in China in 81, bought it for 10 bucks and it wasn't my business, but I kept it as a sample. And when I was in trouble, I, uh, I pulled it out and I had a sales guy I'd brought out from the UK, a friend of mine, Colin Hill, mm. and asked him to go out and see if there was any interest in it. And it was just when digital recording was starting, you know, eight ads and all that kind of stuff. And they were cheap for the incredible quality and everybody needed mics. And it was either German ones at five grand, or I could do this one that I modified and you know, you have warranty, better circuitry, et cetera, for 500 bucks, you know, and I'm on my own. Yeah, it's pretty good. Mm. And that's how Road started. And and the name as well, Road, where does that yeah. come from? Yeah, well, uh, it's funny. So this, my friend Colin came back and he's a Londoner, a Cockney, and he uh, says, oh, these are going to sell as fast as a rat runs up a drain pipe. So we thought, Rodent, hmm, all right, Road, NT, Road, NT1. Oh, make it more European, put a slash through the O, uh, and that's it. So there's a bit Don't of... Don't tell anybody, though. <laughs> um, you celebrated 50 years of road back in 2017. Um, you know, big year. You know, your Prime Minister came out, Prime Minister Turnbull at the time came out to the factory and, you know, a big, big uh, milestone. But what have been some of the uh, greatest achievements for yourself and for the company over the last, you know, 50 plus years? Um, well, so, you know, the, back in the day, uh, 67, when mum and dad started it, that was all live sound, you know, uh, doing installs in the 
top checkers was a big nightclub. You could look it up, the Chevron Silver Spade Room in the Cross, and actually live there now. Uh, it, it's, it's an apartment building, and I saw heaps of uh, shows there at the, at that room, and it's on the same floor I live, which is bizarre, you know. But watching my dad uh, mix those bands, all that stuff is in my mind. But I, I suppose, you know, from the the real pain uh, when I f sold my first product in the US, that was that was pretty special. Um, but that was we were in huge trouble. But I knew it was something special. Out of all the products you've manufactured, you know, from the Rode NT to the, you know, uh, is it the wireless Rode Wireless Go? That's the ones we're wearing for this this interview. You can see them here, on Peter and myself. What's your favourite? What's you know the product to you that you like the most and it means the most to you. I'm, I'm going to say something that um, Enzo Ferrari said and nearly every other designer, Brabham, uh, you know, car engines, uh, um, said the next one I'm making. The next one you're making? That's what they always say. That's a good... And I, yeah. and I, that's, I get it. You know, when I first heard it, come on. Yeah. What about all these classic, nah, the next one. And it's that's about, true. You know, the forward yeah. thinking. Yeah, we're, we're super excited every day walking in, looking at these new products that are in you know, soon coming out. It's like, wow, that's cool. Now, you're, an, you're a strong advocate for manu Aussie manufacturing, mm. um, you know, Australian made, local, locally made. Why is it something that's so important to you, Peter? It's something which you discuss in the media quite a lot, but, you know, why is... A couple, couple of reasons. Well, obviously, it's good for the country to not be, um, you know, reliant on overseas uh, suppliers. And I started when I was buying mics out of China that I was modifying very quickly because they're clever people, work very, very hard. And then they started uh, ripping me off by selling to others, as anybody would. You know? And I'm thinking, hmm, I need to be the master of my own destiny here. And I didn't have a hammer. So I thought, well, let's start buying bits and pieces to start making more and more and more. But you then also have control of quality. You know, our quality is better than anybody at any price, whether it's top European or, you know, certainly wipes out the, the things in China or whatever. And I can make product tomorrow. We're making it now. I don't have to wait three months. I mean, you add it all. Tooling. I used to get quotes for tooling for our injection molding machines of a year. You can do it wow. in a month. What's that? Think about it. You know, the speed to market, you just lose millions. Mm. But it's it's not overnight. You know, it's... Uh, that's 30 years and we've probably got 80, like now probably near 100 million in machines and property. So I can't say to somebody, go and do it. I go, well, with what money and what product and how are you going to sell it? So you know, I can't say, here's the answer. Step one, two, three. No, let's start. You know, if you start, yeah, something will happen. You know, move forward, move there, move there. Doesn't happen overnight, like no, you, said, you know. No, nothing does. And your first plan, that's not going to be the one. So you know, that's my plan. I'm going to go there. You have to have that. And then when you see something change, oh, I mean, then you move over there. It's, it's a life. It's a whole life. Yeah. You've had a big twelve months, Peter. Mm. Uh, it's been a big year of purchases. You know, I've seen you in the headlines quite a bit, and um, I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this have seen you uh, over the last twelve months uh, in the news. You've, for those that don't know. Uh, Peter, why don't you tell them about the purchases? What tell tell them about what you bought and um, you know what inspiration you had to, to accumulate and buy these items. Well, I was I was living in the states all uh, all last year. Um, I had a lot a lot of things to do. For um, I'm involved with some TV shows over there, mm -hmm. and also some here. But uh, so I was there Christmas, and then kind of got locked down, I suppose. And then there was a friend of mine, uh, Darren Julian. He owns the number one auction house in the world for memorabilia. Right? Mm. Never, ever look on his side because you're going to find something you want. You're going to go, oh, no. Anyway, he rings me and says, oh, I might have something you'd be interested in. And he tells me about Kurt's, uh, Kurt Cobain's acoustic D18E, Martin, that he used in the Unplugged gig and a few others. And that was like, wow. Mm. Because I had this plan to do something for musicians, entertainers, everybody, you know, behind the mic. I'm, I'm kind of... Sorry, you know, I'm on the other side mixing, but there's no support, as we all know. There's no wage support, no mental health support, food even. So people were, you know, not dying, but it's like handouts and, you know, living with friends. It's just madness all over the world. So I thought, well, a, a good way as a marketer, you can't just make a noise small. You're never going to be heard. To get a voice, this is going to get me a voice. Mm. And then I can use it as a way to get into other politicians, not just here, which is... It's not worked well, but everywhere in the world. Mm. And yeah, it worked. Um, it 
it was it went for a little bit more than I thought, but in the end I, I thought I gotta buy it no matter what the price, which is yeah. it's a big thing to say, but so I'm sitting there, you know, hopefully never can see my knees shaking. Um, but um it, I got this press thing afterwards, two and a half billion people saw it. You know, the my photo, this I mean that scared me. Because mm. you start getting recognized, especially in the States. I'm sorry, hold on. That's bad. But it did the job, you know. Yeah. It it got it known and so I can now tour it um, everywhere and th I will get, when I am able to leave the country, England, Germany, for everybody, Berlin, they all want to have it at these top yeah. art galleries and museums. And from that I'll be able to push up and say, hey, something's got to be done. Um, and I've, I've got a foundation. It's not, I'm not going to have it in my lounge room or anything. And um, so eventually I'll flog it and uh, put that money into the, the uh, foundation as well. You also made a record-breaking donation to the Sydney uh, Festival earlier in 2021. Why is the arts so important to you, Peter? And did the arts, you know, did um, Trinity inspire you in a way for, you know, with that love for the arts? Well, it certainly was the first time I had ever sort of seen it. You know, the Festival Arts, is that what you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, it. yeah I remember um, and saw that, you know, we sort of dragged in and you kind of exposed to it, whether you... Um, are into it. I can't draw. I can. There used to be a, a, a art teacher, Billy Wallace, I think her name was, and uh, I think I frustrated her like crazy. But you don't know what you do when you expose children to anything, whether it comes out later. But I later on in life, I met people in in, uh, in the arts, whatever they may be, and it affects people in so many ways. It's just like sport, I suppose. Interaction with others, creativity, you know, you learn so much as a child, it does. It's about society. It reflects what's happening in our culture now, on and on and on. When you really, uh, and I'm not an articulate person with that, but when you sort of read what other people who, who are, have read about, said about it, you go, absolutely, a, a society without the arts, in a broader sense, is dead. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, there's no real dough, so you've, you've got to fund them. As we sort of come to a close, do you have any tips for uh, current students, you know, watching, but also students who might have just graduated as to life after Trinity? What tips do you have, um, you know, for them in terms of how to succeed and thrive and, you know, do well post-school once they mm -hmm. walk out the gates? Mm -hmm. I have to look down the camera for this. Really? So it's that camera there? That camera there? That's the camera. This is really long. Never give up. It's a good piece of advice. That's I it. Think, Peter, thank you so much thank for your you time so much. today. I've I love it. It's very really lovely. enjoyed um, sitting down and really getting to know you and hearing about, you thank know, you. all these wonderful things you've done. You're a great example and role model to all of us here. And, you know, when we see you on the news and we hear about you, we're proud to say that you're a you're an old Trinitarian and, uh, you know. Victor Gloria Solidaire. All the best. Thank all you right. so much, Peter. Appreciate it. Thank you.